W-N-S-T, Towson Baltimore and Baltimore Positive. We are positively into a beautiful spring week here. It's opening day. Bruce Springsteen's coming to town. Don Henley's coming to town. Most importantly, Joe Walsh and Timothy B. Schmidt are coming to town. Uh, and uh, most importantly, we're going to be celebrating 50 years of the Maryland Lottery, giving away some instant lottery scratch-offs. We're going to be over at Costas uh, on Wednesday. Uh, I'm bringing my crab mallet from Leonard Raskin as well. I, I'm going to get some crab and pure, but I haven't cracked a crab yet in uh, 2023, so it's sort of ceremonial. I think I'm going to be doing that on Wednesday over at Costas in the afternoon. Uh, also, our friends at Window Nation, I'm wearing my Window Nation gear here, 86690 Nation. Now back to five years, 0% financing if you get your windows. Please do it. It's a good idea. I'm doing all sorts of things. Uh, shout out to Pest Czar for helping us. I, I, I yelled out to the cosmos. I said, I got spiders, 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 bugs, bugs. And the Pest Czar people came running in uh, and helped us out. So I'll be shouting them out as well. Wednesday at Costas, Friday at Fadley's downtown celebrating the opening of the brand new arena. I'm looking forward to it. Springsteen on Friday night, Eagles on Saturday. It's a lot to wear out. A young man like myself, but I remember uh, back in the day when the Baltimore Orioles would open at home on a Monday when the national championship was being played and I have to pick one or the other. Now they're picking 70 degree days. I get to hazily, lazily hang out. And other than drinking too much and trying to hit a yoga mat on Thursday night, Luke, uh, I'm planning on spending some um, Days soaking up the sun, uh, having fun with my friends, just like that 1973 disco song uh, about the Orioles. Um, I, a rough weekend with the gloves, right? Interesting weekend with the bats. Tough weekend with the arms. Uh, looked like cold as hell to be sitting in Fenway Park. I'm glad I wasn't there. Um, but the Orioles are alive and well, and it, it wasn't the start we all want to be talking about. We'll be watching them play in Texas for a couple days. But it's it's a start, and here we are with the season, and Adley Rutschman, Adley Rutschman, Adley Rutschman, right? <laughs> yeah, no question about it. You summed it up pretty nicely there, and it kind of comes down to this. They hit really well. I mean, top to bottom as far as their regulars. Even Gunnar Henderson, who didn't have any hits, but he walked six times. He got home base a lot over the weekend. Offensively, you're happy with where they are, but what do we always talk about? The key to success, and we talked about this a lot with the 2022 club, pitching and defense, right? Well, the Orioles, even on opening day, did not pitch all that well, although it wasn't as quite as bad as the final score looked. But defense issues all weekend. And the pitching on Saturday and Sunday left a lot to be desired. Dean Kramer, not very good at all on Saturday. Cole Irvin had his issues on Sunday. But all of that being said, they were literally a dropped pop fly from Ryan McKenna on Saturday from having still won the series they would have taken two out of three and you'd have a different you know different attitude towards what we saw so look it's it's one series they lost two out of three Uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat it the defense was awful and I will say based on what we know about this club going back to last year some of these guys going back the last few years I'm not as concerned about that I think they'll defend I think their defense will be good I, I think it was a hiccup it's cold it's Fenway Park. It's a weird place to kind of open up a season. You know, again, all the excuses you want to put out there, they didn't def- they d- didn't defend. They kicked the ball around. You well, can't you do that. You play baseball and it's 80 degrees every day for eight weeks and you're and from then it's an not. island. And, yeah. and then you land and everybody's got hoodies on and you're running around out there and everything feels like weird about it. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, again, I mean, they're professionals and they, they'd be the first to tell you, you got to make plays. And, and, again, Ryan McKenna cost them a ball game on Saturday. I mean, he's literally on this roster for his defense and speed. He's not much of a bat. So, wildly disappointing on that front, as, as much as the second game of the season can be. I mean, your hope is... At the end of the year, you're at you're thinking back and you're saying, what was the worst loss of the year? You're hoping it was game two because you lost on a pop fly drop with two outs in the ninth. And then Batista, two pitches later, gives up the game losing home run. Dude, uh, that but, was something right out of Keystone. I mean, yeah, oh, it was as bad a beat as any awful night in the awful, awful strain of Orioles baseball where awful things happened at Yankee Stadium. I mean, it was just... It, it it was uh, Charlie Brownish. I mean, it really yeah. was. Yeah, I mean, that can't happen. I mean, but the only thing I could think of that was worse at Fenway Park over the last 20 years was the Mother's Day massacre years ago. Remember, they what, they were up five or whatever it was in the ninth inning, and they lost to them. Uh, but it was brutal. 
is brutal. And so that said, again, the defense I'm not as nearly as concerned about the defense. I think the track record of even some of these guys who haven't been around quite as long, you know, I, I think Austin Hayes said it best uh, after Saturday's loss, you know, Ryan McKenna catches that ball 999 times out of a thousand, but it costs him a ball game. But on the pitching front, that is where I do have questions. You know, I, I think fair questions uh, as far as, uh, what this team's going to look like. And certainly, uh, I mean, you give you give up nine runs in each of your first three games. I mean, that's well below the bar. So it'll be better than that, but we've talked about it. I've written about it at baltimorepositive.com, especially the state of the bullpen as it's presently constructed with Dylan Tate on the IL, Michael Givens on the IL. Th- there's some concern there, and certainly they need to get better performance from their starters. I mean, get, well, get whatever some... innings means... Paul Rodriguez. Let's take those three guys. Oh, sure. Your three best pitchers in the organization. They've logged uh, zero innings, and they're sure. probably going to log zero innings for a little bit, and then it's going to look like a couple of innings. But maybe in August, they're logging 20 innings a week. You know, I mean, maybe more. Right, right. I mean, and certainly that's – you know, that's the long-term upside you're looking at right now. And specifically, Grayson Rodriguez, we talked about this a little bit last week with the decision to option him. You know, he had a rough spring. First start for Norfolk wasn't great. You know, it wasn't awful either, but certainly was, you know, they're, they're looking for a little more consistency from him. And keep in mind, he missed three months last year with that lad injury, uh, which really disrupted what was going to be a, a June promotion last year. So it's well, it disappointing. it's very easy but... for Jim Palmer to go on and say he didn't pitch well enough. It's just yeah. easy. It's just easy. Yeah. You didn't pitch. You want to know why he's not here? He didn't pitch well enough. That's the way this works. And that was pretty obvious at the end of spring training, right? I mean, and as Palmer said a couple of times, all he had to do was, you know, just show he belonged here, and he hasn't done that yet. And that that's disconcerting when he's the number one prospect in baseball. I mean, the thing about Rutschman, d- despite the first weekend of whatever it was last year, he he has looked like he belongs, and that's yeah. what you want for – you don't want Rodriguez coming up here having an eight and a half. And again, I go back – I don't know why I thought about Rocky Coppinger the other day, but I just do <laughs> because I think of all-time guys that were a little bit of a meathead and a little bit of a never made it and a little bit of a scratch your head and say, how could someone have an ERA of two at Bowie and, just, you know, like all the way through and not make it? How does that happen? Right. How does that ever happen? I just they always say that step to the big leagues is the biggest. And I think it's also the most disconcerting when you make it and don't make it when you get there and you're and you're overwhelmed or you're injured, you know, and trying to make it. And I think all of that goes into this kid with the injury last year that that as a 55 year old guy and as Jim Palmer being a Hall of Famer that's forgotten more. I think it's a red flag for everybody to say slow down a little bit. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. And, and I wrote about this. I, I talked about this with you briefly. Uh, look, I don't think it's the end of the world. And I know a lot of people were ticked off and they're talking about service time manipulation. And let's be clear, Michael Elias has manipulated uh, and and he's one of many general man- managers who do that kind of thing. And look, did the Orioles look at this and say, OK, Grayson didn't throw the ball as consistently well as we would have hoped in the spring? Let's let's slow down here. And oh, yeah, maybe if, if it benefits us from a service time standpoint, we'll also live with that. Right. You know, to wait, me, wait. I don't want to screw the kid up because right. I, and I don't think they want to screw the kid up. And I think they're smarter than some of the batches of guys who've screwed people up where, you know, in Buck Showalter's case, it was we drafted you, kid. Get in here. Get in here. Right. Pitch. Oh. Play. That That's different than I think the way this is going to be handled to some degree and the service time issue. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'll hear all that, but right. in the end, if they felt like he could get guys out tonight in Texas, he'd be here. I think, well, the, well, there's that, but th- then the other side of this is if other guys who are in the current rotation aren't going to pitch all that well, then we'll see him sooner rather than later. I mean, that's just how this works. So yeah, in, in a big picture sense, I'm much more of the thought of, if he doesn't make his debut until the end of April or the beginning of May, you know, give him a few starts to get get himself ironed out, all the kinks out, uh, command back to where uh, it's been in the past. You know, the stuff is still there. You know, I, I, I haven't heard any concerns on that front. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 presum- the presumption is that he, you know, the assumption is that he's healthy. So, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world to pump the brakes, 
give him a chance to exhale, go down to Norfolk, put together some good starts there, you know, at least decent starts, let's say, and then give him the call. Uh, in the meantime, you know, you, you see how uh, the current five pitches and, uh, you know, first weekend at, at Fenway, you know, Kyle Gibson was better than the numbers indicated. I think he was let down a little bit. I, I thought he was fine at least. Uh, but Dean Kramer, not good on Saturday. And Cole Irvin, not not very good on, on Sunday either. So, yeah, I mean, it's a— You want it, more out of the veteran guys who've been no up question. the mountain and played in cold baseball and been in a crowd no stadium. Question. and. Uh, but then again, the guys behind them not catching the ball. H- how about them running the bases and the Red Sox treating it like Lucy's catching? I mean, what what was that? It's really interesting. And this is if we're going to talk now about the rules, right? You know, people have talked about the bigger bases and, and inherently that makes the, the base path pa- base pass slightly shorter. But the big one is obviously the pitch clock. And I well, think the pickoffs also it, too. Right. I mean, you two, can only have the picks and all of a sudden it's I'm running. Yeah, because because you try it again and, and if you don't get them, it's a balk. So then it's a stolen base anyway, if, essentially. So it very much becomes interesting in that, in that way. But it is interesting that to, to see the numbers and, and the Orioles were an extreme. You know, they stole 10 bases over their first two games, which is unheard of. I feel like there were years of, of Buck Showalter Orioles where they wouldn't steal 10 bases in two months, let alone Dude, two six games. of them were gifted. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, and you talk about I, things that are going to make more offense. I mean, 10 more times in the series guys got from first to second free of charge. That's great. Yeah, or second I mean, to it's, third. <laughs> it, it's interesting. And it, it's one of those factors that when, when you kind of talk about the unintended consequences, I mean, I don't know if you want that much, you know, that much of a change in terms of stolen bases. I think everyone was saying, yeah, let's, let's see some more, you know, more of the running game and, and guys trying to steal. And certainly the Orioles, I mean, Mateo and Mullins were one, two in the American league in stolen bases last year. So it's not as though the Orioles don't have speed that, that was already built in. But I think with the pitch clock, the fact that you have a clock, the fact that when you're going to see it count down, knowing a, a pitcher, okay, he can step off and he might step off once or twice, but you can kind of time that up. Right. So that, that that's something that I think is going to be interesting to monitor as we saw quite a few stolen bases over the first weekend across baseball. Dude, it's a better game. Yeah. Hey, I, I don't mean, have... It took me three days to watch it. And my wife and I are watching it, and we're like, oh, we can stay with it. It's the seventh inning, and they're actually going to play baseball instead of jerk off and jerk around and come off the mound <laughs> and play games and warm up and come in and scratch their nuts and have a meeting and, <laughs> and have a review. And, and like, seriously, I, yeah. I swear to God, we were, are we going to watch women's basketball in the final? Or are we going to watch the eighth and ninth inning of a four-run ball game? And we kind of hung in because... Yeah, you know the ish happened quickly. You, you know, I mean, it feels like it's happening all of a sudden instead of back in, and, and and that's welcomed as a 55 year old. That and I'm not a 20 year old kid who doesn't have attention span issues. But like, let's get the games going. You, you know what I mean? We're we're here to see the game. We're not here to see you scratch your nuts and jump off the mound and have meetings and 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 have be a human rain delay. That's over for the sport. Yeah, no that's question about forever it. Forever now, I think. I, I think so. Uh, and and look, could there be an adjustment that they find that maybe it, the clock needs to be tweaked here or there in certain situ- situations? I I think that's possible. But I, I think you're right. And I think opening day, and I wrote this at BaltimorePositive.com, I think opening day was a perfect case study. Let's face it. Let's go back and look at the box score for the Orioles Red Sox. I have that in front of me right now. A combined 19 runs, a combined 26 hits. A combined three errors, a combined, uh, the Orioles drew nine walks, the Red Sox drew three. So you had 12 walks, you had 17 strikeouts, you had 12 total pitchers used. The Orioles threw a total of 153 pitches, the Red Sox threw a total of 191 pitches. Now, if I had told you that, Nestor, it's a four hour and 17 minute game. Yeah, that is a game pushing four hours, right? Give or take a few minutes. You're thinking that's a, a three fifty. That's a three forty eight. That's a fifty pitches. That game on opening day, three hours ten minutes. That's if that's the kind of game that. And look, there were a lot of walks, all that. Like I said, and we can debate how good, how well that game was played overall. But to have all of that happen in the game and for it to be three hours ten minutes, you can live with that. I don't need every single game to be under three hours. I just don't want every single one to be 
three to three and a half, right? Or three to four. So, so you know, I, I think the early returns on, on the pitch clock, uh, I think that the overall sentiment that you've seen from certainly younger major leaguers uh, and, and some of these guys having experienced the pitch clock at the minor league level the last few years, I think the the, the overall sentiment is, yeah, it's an adjustment. It's a little bit different than what we're used to, but we're getting used to it. And if it makes for a better game, if it makes for a better product, uh, if it makes more people engaged uh, rather than what you just know, mentioned out uh, when there's other stuff on and you, know, you got a game that's dragging and there's no end in sight. You know, I, I think a lot of people that, that turns off a lot of people, even people who love baseball, to your point. So I, I think that's been a, an overall positive. Again, well, they need to tweak it at some point. Is there going to be a certain circumstance or a certain situation that they hadn't thought about before? Well, then you can adjust it. But I think by and large, you're right. It's not going away. And I think it's been far more positive than negative in terms of the concerns with the pitch clock. So, you know, and and haven't even mentioned the, the elimination of the shift, which, you know, I had mixed feelings on, but it does make, aesthetically speaking, uh, a better product, a, a game that's more enjoyable to watch. So uh, we'll see how it plays out again. We're still dealing with a small sample size, but I think, you know, even going back to spring training, seeing the time of average time of game really kind of shave off roughly a half hour, you know, that's, that, that's, it's funny. We baseball, we always talk about longing for the past, right? We're very romantic. We're very traditionalist when it comes to baseball, baseball fans themselves. Uh, but you look at the, the way that America has kind of evolved We've gotten faster in every other element of our life, right? Cell phones, everything, smartphones compared to uh, how we used to consume information. But you go back to 30 or 40 years ago, the average time of game in baseball was much more, you know, much quicker. You know, it was a much uh, faster game in terms of the pace. So nice to to have some mechanisms in place to to try to turn things back, uh, so to speak, uh, in that regard. And you know, the clock is not distracting. You know, it's not like the shot clock in basketball. I, you know, I don't think we're going to see fans counting down or anything like that, but uh, it, it's an adjustment, but I think it's been a positive adjustment so far. I would just say this on the clock. I, I, I'm okay with it. I, I think in the postseason, if they added five seconds, it'd be okay with me. And I think in the postseason, to think about it a little bit more, it always, the postseason always felt a little bit more pregnant, a little bit more yeah. quiet, a little bit more thoughtful. I mean, even back in the 80s when I was a kid, it felt like the pace of it was much more deliberate because every game was a knockout. And obviously in the five game series and the way they play it now, it's, it's different. Um, but, uh, Luke is here, Baltimore Luke. You can find him. The Orioles are having opening day on Thursday. You're excited. We're excited. People are coming downtown. The weather should be good. Uh, we're going to be all around at Costas on Wednesday and at Fadley's on Friday. Also taking the Maryland Crab Cake Tour up to Bel Air. We'll be at Pappas on the 13th at the new Bel Air location, just in the North Bel Air, just north of John Carroll. Uh, also uh, on the 27th, we're going to be down at Captain Larry's down in Federal Hill. Um, really looking forward to that. I've heard great things about their crab cake down there. It's right down the street from Pike's house so we're looking forward to get back downtown to ford avenue and doing that uh, on the baseball side of the weekend uh, the catch that the kid with the angels made in renfro and right field was amazing right you know a lot of times you get these no hitters and perfect games and crazy stuff happening first weekend and um but the orioles coming into focus into all of this and playing every day and getting sort of basketball out of our system and the san diego state mm -hmm. thing and the connecticut thing and all of that um for for the the, the heartbeat of it, and for what I built here for 31 years, it feels different this year because they have a chance. You've been doing this a long time as a fan, as a friend, as a, you know, a, a, a professional doing this for 15 years. And you pointed out on your fingers the other day how many chances when we're pooping on Angelo's. By the way, John's everywhere now except here. He's on TV. He's on radio. He's out. It. I'm going to be writing about both of these owners and accountability and who's out in front, who's in the back. I'm going to be re-releasing the Peter Principles. I've been doing a lot of thinking and drinking over the weekend. I'm singing, too, by the way. Thank you, Ace, and the guys in the Cultivated. I was over my old stomping grounds at the Emerald Tavern the other day. Um, so, But the baseball Jones, and I don't mean flags on cars. I don't even mean my Facebook timeline. I don't even mean people that aren't into baseball becoming into baseball. But my wife and I watching the Red Sox and the Orioles – and over the weekend and having that be back again um, and a chance and players I'm interested in, 
and new broadcasters and new this and new I, I'm just I'm flying in and I'm diving in because there was no spring training. There were no games. I'm seeing the little Caesar run around. It's almost comical. Like, <laughs> I mean, it really is comical um, to watch this after seeing the lawsuit. Like, It's just I'm just eating it. I'm, I'm Michael Jackson in the thriller video. I'm eating the popcorn as an outsider. I've reapplied for my press credential with the Orioles. We'll see how that goes as well. But you're going down to the ballpark this weekend, eating the hot dogs. I'm going to be um, wearing my Oriole jacket, or maybe not. It's going to be 70 degrees. I, maybe I get to wear my new uh, lucky orange shirt that I that I got that I wore to Hollywood Casino. But I'm excited about it. I'm excited about going downtown. I, I guess I'm going to go for a couple of innings on Thursday. I don't have a ticket yet, but I usually figure it out. Um, but – I want to dive in and at least have some fun with it because there hasn't been much that's been fun lately, dude, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's look, they've got a chance and look, let's not overreact in the same way that if they swept the Red Sox, we wouldn't be talking pennant already, you know, as we're talking about the first few days of April, but there's certainly a a level of expectation that hasn't been there since the end of the Buck Showalter era. I mean, let's call a spade a spade. This is a team that, you know, held on a couple years too long, so to speak, uh, as far as that era with the way that things just kind of disintegrated and, you know, they didn't get great value for Manny Machado it, it, once you got to the point where you weren't going to extend them. But, you know, that's How much water. Are they paying the... Chris Davis still? They uh, haven't been the deal with him. For oh, like they're still. Def- it's, it's a yeah, lot of def- money, right? Oh, he's still he'll be making money for a long time. I mean, there are a lot of deferments. I mean, it's not quite the Bobby Bonilla Mets deal, but it's, you know, but is he getting five or 10 million this year? Like real money? I think I, he is, I, right? I'd have to, I'd have to look, I mean, he's yeah, getting it's, real money. you know, yeah. but, but mistakes that are made, that's sure. a legitimate $10,000 a week. They're sending to him or whatever it is for forever. So, yeah. So when we talk about Lamar's money and like, <laughs> you know, forever's a long time, <laughs> I'll just say that it, it is, it, it is, but you know, all of those, and look, we've talked about it with ownership, the stadium lease, mass, and all the different off the field issues that, let's be clear, have an impact on what is going to happen on the field in terms of players you add or don't add and all that. But that aside, there there's a lot to be to, there's a lot to like about this team, even with an ugly couple games over the weekend. And you know, I, I think there's there's some buzz for it. To your point, it's not Super Bowl. A car flag kind of buzz just yet or or anything like that. But I think there's some intrigue. There's a level of interest. You know, I I could even see it on my social media, even had some of my friends texting me about the games who aren't exactly people that watch the Orioles on a nightly basis. So there's always a a little bit of that at the beginning of the year. But as I said, I talked about this with you. I've talked about this with Dennis, with the Ravens being where they are with Lamar Jackson and their off season. And even the most optimistic of Ravens fans, it's unsettling. When to this point, you've made one outside addition to your roster. I mean, that's just where they are. Uh, there, There's an opportunity for the Orioles to really create some buzz here and some interest and, and to really, they're not going to overtake the Ravens. NFL's king everywhere, not just in Baltimore, but it is a chance for them to garner some attention and to create some enthusiasm if they can get off to a good start. Now, one and two over the weekend, not what you're looking for. That's obvious, but uh, if they can win a series in Texas and then come home and play well and and get off to a a good start here over the first few weeks, then I think you'll have more and more people paying attention and tuning in on a nightly basis or a semi-nightly basis uh, to see how this team is faring. So, And to your point, first time in at least, and, and this is the kindest timeline, at least five years since the Orioles have had any kind of semblance of hope going into a season. Looked up the Chris Davis numbers. You ready? I was Go. way off, dude. Lay it I on mean, me. I mean, way off. Way off. Like, I said, is he still getting $6 million a year? Ready? It's it's a lot. I can't remember the exact number, but when it's When he lot. signed his contract, it was set up with $42 million in deferred mm-hmm. payments. Okay? So, starting in 2023, which is now. Right. He will receive $9.16 okay. million. For the next three years, the 1.6 million is 160,000, by the way. Right. Um, so, so he will receive 9.16 million this year, next year, and 25. So that's 28 million. He's getting the next three years, mm-hmm. 27 and uh, 27.4. Starting in 26, 
it goes down to three point five million a year. Oh, that's all. That's, that's for seven years. <laughs> that's for seven yeah. years. Okay, that's seven more years. Right. So that's another twenty four million. And then then starting in twenty twenty uh, thirty three. So that's ten years from now. He will receive one point four million yearly for five more years. Yeah, I five think more lottery tickets. I think his payments, the the deferred payments, I believe go until I want to say like, he'll be like fifty two or fifty three years old, something like that. Like I said, it's not quite as crazy as the Bobby Bonilla one. It's well, crazier when he's getting nine million a year because oh yeah, Benilla's getting some money, but this is like right. This oh, is I just, lotto money. This is different I, kind of money. Right, right. I just meant the term for for Benia, but yeah, I mean he's making some very serious money still. And look, I mean the Orioles signed up for this back in 2016. I mean, it's, and you I wonder why sympathy. Lamar Jackson needs an agent? <laughs> no question. No question. <laughs> Luke Jones is here. He is agenting and overseeing all things in the Orange Universe at Oriole Park at Camden Yards. He'll be eating hot dogs. I'll be drinking the beer. We'll be downtown on opening day. We're going to be over at Costas on Wednesday doing the Maryland Crab Cake Tour presented by the Maryland Lottery in conjunction with our friends at Goodwill. Got some great guests on Wednesday as well as on Friday morning uh, opening a new arena. I'm so excited. I was trying to find all my old arena buddies and do you have a Civic Center memory? Do you, do you have a favorite Civic Center memory? I mean, I, I just think about Bruno San Martino and yeah. Billy, superstar Billy Graham. I think about being there with Cindy Lauper coming out of re- – just for your perspective, Georgia mm-hmm. Championship Wrestling, the first time Ric Flair came in. Like, I, I, I just – I saw Andre the – like, just wrestling memories alone. Haystacks, Calhoun, just wrestling memories alone would be amazing. But then there's the Harlem Globetrotters. Then there's the Baltimore Clippers and all of the Clippers and the Skipjacks that came after. After that and the death dogs and working down there and the blast and taking girls in the eighties for blast games and the black Sabbath and sticks and Van Halen and Judas priest and black Sabbath and Paul Stanley and Peter and, and, and Peter Chris and Steven Tyler putting his head on my shoulder at an Aerosmith show and drinking beer with the guys from triumph when I was underage and seeing Gary Richrith from REO Speedwagon hammered out of his mind with Kevin Cron just Bands and music in Chicago and U2 and the Stones and the Eagles and Springsteen and Springsteen. And now they're going to redo the arena. I mean, I haven't even mentioned the, the the circuses and I haven't even mentioned the bullets games. And I haven't even mentioned me being the, the announcer with the series. Do, 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 do. George Mason. So, I, you know, I did all of these fun things in that building. I'm going to go back in there on Friday night and Springsteen's going to like... And it's going to be like a different building. Like I, that's, I, I, that's exciting for me. I, there's nowhere I've been other than like Memorial Stadium. Like literally, the Capital Center has been gone for 25 years. The arena was just there, and I guess I got to think about the last time I was in there. I don't even remember. Remember, like I walked out of there, and it's a different thing. But I am <laughs> really, really excited about this. And in, in a curious way because i've wondered my whole life what's going to become of that what are they going to do with that yeah it's fun and you asked me my favorite memories i mean mostly wrestling Uh, i mean it really was now my old man and my mom taking me to wwf shows back you know whether it's civic center or or, uh the capital center i don't really have any legitimate did your dad ever take you to a hockey game or a blast game there I'm sure I went to, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I went to, ca- uh, you know, Skip Jacks and the, the Blast at least a game or two. I mean, it wasn't something we did regularly, but we God, certainly I gotta did think, that. Dude, but... I saw all sorts of things. There. My dad would take me down there for, uh, for hockey practice. Like, just so many things. Like, I saw boxing there. Reggie Gross delivered a punch and blood flew all over my notebook. I mean, like I had nights at the, at the, like the arena's just, I was at, I was at the blood circus with Ox Baker came in and, <laughs> and Charlie Ekman and, and Artie Donovan came by the seats. The guy was a scam artist. Like I have so many memories there, man. It's incredible. I'm looking right now. I found this. So I went to WWF SmackDown in 1999 I'm looking, I pulled up the card, actually. It was November of 1999. It was a couple weeks before Survivor Series, which is one of their big four pay-per-views. But I have the card. I'm going to just fire away here and go off the list. I'm going to tell you the Hall of Famers that were on this card. Kurt Angle, that was before he actually made his TV debut as as Kurt Angle. Uh, 
it uh the edge who's in the wwe hall of fame the dudley boys who are hall of famers uh, the godfather is a hall of famer uh big boss man was was on that card and then you ready for it here here's the main event of the night the rock shane mcmahon kane test who uh passed away years ago uh they defeated degeneration x guess who else was there that night stone cold steve austin did a run in arnold schwarzenegger was there that night just making an appearance for a movie he was doing so I was at that. It was a TV taping show, which, which usually isn't as good as a house show because, you know, you got your laws with the commercials and everything. But looking at this card, I'm like, man, that, that's, a, that's probably you – know, I've been the one WWE pay-per-view in my life up in Hershey uh, that I went to 20 years ago. But that's probably, you know, top to bottom the most impressive card I've seen in person. I mean, I just, just named a dozen Hall of Famers who appeared on that show that night. I mean, that's – it's pretty cool. So yeah, I mean, uh, and I know AEW is going to be a, a, at the arena. Uh, they're they're doing a dynamite taping there, I, I believe, in about a month. Uh, so that's going to be one of the earlier, uh, you know, one of the earlier events for the revamped or arena. So yeah, looking I'll be forward there twice to it. This but... weekend. So I mean, yeah, I'm looking at Anita Baker. I'm looking at Janet Jackson. I'm that's looking cool. at Brian Adams. I'm looking at John Mayer. I'm looking at Adam Sandler. You know, so events are coming. Everything that they promised is being delivered. And I'm going to drag you down for something before it's all over. Well, put the Foo Fighters back together, and we'll get you down for that. All right, Lucas. Sounds good. Sounds You'll be good. You'll be at Oriole Park Definitely all week. Definitely looking we're in a little bit of a delay. Wait, he'll be at Oriole Park all week. He'll be at Owings Mills if anything's going on. We got draft happening later on. Uh, I'll be drinking some drafts on Thursday morning as well as Wednesday afternoon over at Costa. Then on Friday morning, we'll be down at Fadley's. Also, a great place to grab a crab cake before opening day. I'll be at Fadley's opening day, too, before the game. But we're actually doing the show on Friday. But I'll be there Thursday promoting Friday and having a crab cake because that's what I do. All right, I'm Nestor. We are WNSD AM 1570 Towson, Baltimore. We never stop talking. Baltimore, positive.